a word. We're into a word. Now, most of you are not old enough to remember the 60s, okay? Uh, you know, you, you all were maybe just babes in arms, you know. No, not the 1860s, no, not the Civil War. I remember that. Uh, but in the 60s, what were some of the key ideas that floated around that people wanted? Make love, not war. Make love, not war. That's a good one. And what was another one? Give peace a chance. Give peace a chance. And that's the word we're going to talk about is the idea of peace. Because when you talk about peace back then, it was things like, you know, against the Vietnam War. I don't care where you are politically, right, left, up, down, doesn't matter. This was a real big topic of conversation, wasn't it? It was there. And there were all of the protests uh, about the war in Vietnam. And, you know, we have John Lennon and Yoko Ono. You know, what did they say? And that's a nice thing to say. And you thought, well, that's back in the 60s. You know, when I still had it, I had a fro back then. You know, I had the, the pick and everything. And I had the, the mustache. And when I, when I went into Turkey, they really weren't sure about letting me in. They were really not sure about letting me out. But that's a different story. But even today, isn't peace a topic of conversation? There are, today, there are protest, peace protests around the world. Here's just some little segment from literally around the world. Israel, Istanbul, all over the place, people uh, protesting, wanting peace. And in case you're interested where this is all happening, I am not making this one up, okay? Some, something, sometimes you look at me and you sort of tilt your head and you wonder, nah, he's making that up. This is legit. Here's the website you can go to. It is the Global Protest Tracker. There are people who have nothing better to do. Uh, they're actually, this is actually funded by the Carnegie uh, endowments, and they track all over the place what's going on with protests, about what, where, how many people. There are tons of protests about all sorts of different things. And I, I, I sort of went through it, and, I, and you know, a lot of it was related to people want peace. People are tired of conflict. Do you think, how, how do you feel about that? Are you, you think peace is an, uh, what do you think about wanting peace? Or do we have it? I think it's a good thing to want and to have. I don't think we have it right now. How else would you think, yes? Okay. It could be, but does the idea of wanting peace, does that really do something inside of you? Because you say, you know what, I'm, I'm just tired of all of the conflict. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of conflict. And my, the new word, the new word is everything is outrage. Everything is Outrage, you know. Uh, somebody got a parking ticket. They are outraged. I mean, it, it is that, it's come to that level. And there was an article in the paper this week about how people are not responding to outrage. It used to be, there's something, it's bad, we're outraged, we're going to do something about it. Well, guess what? Is anybody doing anything about it today? 
Why do you think? Okay, it looks like the the movies, movies, videos, movie videos, yeah, games, games. games. The people that are actually in power won't do anything about it. The, the, they, the, oh, I like that one. The people in power actually stay in power. The more outrage there is. Yeah. Well, they don't really get involved in it. That's mm -hmm. it. And maybe, how's this for a reason? People are tired of outrage. They are outraged out. Yeah. They have no more emotional energy. They're drained. This whole thing with the pandemic and everything and inflation and everything else, the shootings, and I don't care where you are on the political spectrum, and everything with uh, abortion and Roe Wade, you know, it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling, and people are saying, I'm, I'm tired. I'm worn out. And boy, wouldn't peace be nice? A little peace. Because peace, the Oxford English Dictionary talks about it in these terms. Freedom from disturbance and the idea of tranquility. Doesn't the word tranquility sound good? Yes. Doesn't that sound nice? Or the second one is, has to do a state or period which there is no war, or war has ended. See, it's this thing, you know, that, that this conflict, you know, there's battles. You think about what's happening in, in the Ukraine and other parts around the world. You think about the fighting that's going on. They say, peace. Well, that's peace. Well, maybe God has a little bit of different definition of peace. It's not just war, because Jesus talks about having peace, but there's still wars going on. So peace, in God's sort of view, his picture in his head, is more than just not beating somebody up. It's, I'm going to suggest that it's the idea of wholeness, that everything is together. You know, the, you have whole grain. What is the difference between flour that you get in the store and whole grain flour? What's the difference? It's not been refined down to where there's no nutritional value. Very good. It, all the different pieces of the grain. The grain is not just like a piece of plastic that's just all one thing, right? It's got the shell, it's got the germ and all these other things. It's all together. Think about an orange. Is an orange just one thing? No. no. What what makes up an orange? Skin, rind, the, and seeds. Skin, rind, seeds, pulp, pulp juice. the juice. Yeah, there's lots of pieces in the orange, but it is an orange when it's all together. A loaf of bread is what? It's made from lots of different things right what's in bread flour yeast, flour, yeast water, water lard. lard or fat how uh, i'm sorry salt. salt very good a little bit of sugar to make the yeast grow give it something to chew on you know it's this idea of peace is it's a whole it's not a piece as in a piece of pizza it's the whole pie. You know, you can have a puzzle, and if you're missing a piece, what happens? You don't have the whole thing, do you? And pieces of a puzzle, do you just sort of throw them down and they, they magically align themselves? Or do you chew off the ends of them? Or maybe use an X-Acto knife to make them fit? No. When they are, when all the, com I use the word components, okay, instead of pieces, when all the components come together, they fit together well. They don't have, you don't want to see me and making things out of wood, okay? You really don't, because I don't care, okay? If it's not an exact straight line, who's going to see it? 
I'll put some putty in there, some caulk, I'll fill it up. You know, it comes together and it wiggles, right? Because it's not flat, it's not real tight. Well, who cares? I'll put another threaded screw in there and tighten it up and nobody's going to see. Quick and dirty. That's, that's my middle initial. Quick and dirty. But God says no. It's like a rope. The rope has all these individual pieces of thread in it. But when they come together tightly and are woven together, what happens? Becomes incredibly strong. And come, it even gets tough to cut. Because the idea of not peace in God's sort of way of thinking is it's been worn out. The threads have been stretched or broken. And it becomes weak. It becomes weak. And you can pull, pull this apart. Peace is the way God made the universe. You know, they got this new uh, uh, satellite up there, you know, observatory. Have you seen any of the pictures? Yes. What do you think of the pictures? Very clear. Very clear. Distinct. Distinct. They're seeing farther than they've ever seen. And nobody has seen the end. You know, there's not a checker flag out there, so many billions and billions of light years, as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions. You know, way out, there is no end to it. And we keep reaching and we say, well, it's gotta be out there somewhere. But guess what? The God of the universe, who doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end, made it. And it is marvelous to look at it, to study it, because we can learn about him through it. And even in the life of Jesus, starting from the very beginning, when Mary hears about that she's going to have, be born, going to bear the, the, the Son of God, and she tells her cousin, they talk about peace. When Jesus is born, what do the angels say? They say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, what? Peace, Peace on those who, whom, on whom his favor rests. The idea, God wants us to experience his peace, to have all the pieces together, to be aligned, that they fit together well, that it's a whole, not just these little things going out and even in the still in the story of the birth of Jesus they Jesus gets uh, circumcised and then they take him to the temple to be uh, dedicated and who's there a guy by the name of Simeon and Simeon sees the Christ child and his bucket list is fulfilled you got a bucket list? Simeon had a bucket list. Because we say, how do you know that, Chet? It says, because Simeon tells us he had a bucket list. Listen to what he says. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, uh, there's the list, you may now dismiss your servant, how? In peace. Why? Because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory of your people Israel. He had a bucket list. I want to see the Christ. He sees Jesus and he says, the list is done. I'm good. Take me home. Does seeing Jesus fulfill your bucket list? That's a, I'm not asking you to answer that question. I'm ans asking that question of myself. Is there a point where I can say, oh, sovereign Lord, take me home because what you promised is now done? To have that kind of bucket list. And Jesus goes on 
in, in his parables, when he talks about salt, salt is good, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and what? Be at peace with each other. To be at peace with one another. But it's not just peace, is it? What, what's the other thing we're supposed to have with one another? Salt. Doesn't it say we're supposed to have salt with one another? So what, how, how do we have salt and peace with one another? Does that mean we just pat each other on the head? Or we walk around with a salt shaker and say, here. Is that what it means? I think it means to love each other. It means to love each other? Be in each other's lives, yes. But that's what I was to say. Season, we are supposed to season one another. Season one another. With the God's love. With God's love. The interesting thing about salt is salt is a purifier. It's a purifier. But salt has one other thing going for it. It just doesn't stay on the outside. Salt always always, always goes inside. This week, I wanted to make a chicken, okay? And this, I, so I, I'm not to get too pedantic or weird, but I spatchcocked the chicken. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. It's a chicken that you cut out the back and then you splay it out like this, okay? And you beat it, you break its breastbone so it's flat, okay? So, but I did that and I took the chicken and I got some water and put some salt in it, mixed it up and soaked the chicken in the salt water because it will make it flavorful, it'll keep it moist. And then I took, I made some sliced potatoes, put it in the bottom of the pan and then put the chicken on top of the pan. So all those juices ran out onto the potatoes. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I jammed butter up underneath the skin of the chicken. So that melted and got in the chicken and all was in the potatoes and I'm making myself hungry. So we're gonna move on. But anyway, the salt didn't just go on the outside of the chicken. It went inside. So when we we're to have salt with one another, like Joe said, we're, in each, we're helping one another in our, each other's lives but not just on the outside, we're to help each other on the inside too. My prayer, it's not too much to say, but every Sunday morning, after I get all this stuff sit up, set up, I come here and I kneel. I kneel because that's sort of my heritage. I, th I, I sense I'm really doing business with God when I'm on my knees. Not for everybody, okay? Not for everybody. But my prayer is that, God, you would use your word and that it get inside of us. Like that salt. You know, Mar Mother Teresa understood this. Boy, did she understand this when you see her life. And she said, if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to one another. Preach it, sister. We are to be encouragement to one another. To help one another. Not just on the outside, but even on the inside. I have a dear friend who lives in another part of the country. And I called him up this week. And just to chat a little bit. And he says, you got a minute? I said, Sure. And he starts telling me about some things going on in his life. And in his life, in his family, and in his life with his wife. I took my shoes off because I knew I was on holy ground. I said, I'm on your team, I'm on your wife's team. Pray for you, I'm pray for you right now over the phone. We're to be in each other's lives that kind of way. 
And Jesus demonstrates this when he comes to Mary and Martha. Martha, I just love Martha. I don't know if you remember her. But, you know, Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. Jesus is teaching. And what's Martha doing? She's cooking. She's washing. She's setting up the buffet. Right? She's running all over. And what does Jesus say to her? Martha, Martha, you are worried. What's the difference between worried and peace? Ooh, turmoil. I, I'm sorry? Torment. Torment. Total opposites. Peace. Everything is together in its place. The way it was meant. Worry is taking those pieces apart. Everything's got to be perfect. You know, not just sitting there, but there's, there's nothing wrong with getting ready for its supper. But Martha, good night nurse. Enough is, you know, to carry out from Chick-fil-A would have been good enough. You know, she, she, she's just tearing herself apart. She took the opposite. Instead of peace and saying, I'm here, to help Jesus? No. She got worried. And that worry is pulling pieces apart. It's like when you, you know, I showed you that piece of pizza. It was together. It was all there. Martha's, no, I got to rip it apart. Again, you all wouldn't remember Peter and Gordon, but they sang a song. I go to pieces. That's the opposite of peace. I go to pieces. Now, when you have seen somebody go to pieces, I know we don't, but if you've seen it in somebody else's life, what are some of the triggers for them? It could be many different things depending on what they went through. Okay, depending on what they went through. Mm -hmm. Could, infidelity. infidelity, yeah, all these things. You know, we have an expectation that says life is supposed to be this way, whatever way that is, okay? And when something messes that up, messes up the peace of that tranquility, I can lose it. I can really lose it. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be somebody smashed into my car. I went one morning out to the mailbox and I pulled something, I pulled out the mail and I saw this one thing there and I lost it. I can't explain why. I have no excuse, okay? It was wrong. But just seeing this thing just pushed me over the edge. We all have that tipping point. And we're told to be on the lookout because when we're told not to be anxious for some things, to be anxious about anything. But what's the opposite? But in every situation, by prayer and petitions with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Anxious, when we are being pulled apart, emotionally, relationally. However, we get pulled apart and we freak out. But we're told when we're being pulled apart, when we're being distracted, what are we to do? We're to do what? Pray, not just pray, pray with... How do you pray with thanksgiving? By praising Jesus at the time. Praising Jesus at the time. Do you have an answer right then? No. no. That's what pray, praying with thanksgiving says. God, this problem is all over me like a cheap suit. Okay? God, I'm coming to you, and I'm going to pray that you take care of this, take care of me, and I'm going to do it with thanksgiving. 
guess what? The cheap suit's still on me. I'm still probably in the middle of it. Nehemiah has been praying and planning about rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem, which is hundreds of miles away. And he shows up to the king, and the king says, Hey, Ne, I guess that's the short name for Nehemiah. Hey, Ne, yo, Ne, yo, Ne, Bubba. He was from the south. And he said, you know, what's up? And he became afraid, right? And he says, and he told, and then the king says those immortal words, what do you want? The king says, I got my MasterCard, I got my Visa, I got my American Express. What do you need? What does Nehemiah do? Does he pull out his list? Does he say, oh, let me pull that up on my phone, let me text it to you? What does he do? He prayed right there in front. I mean, I don't think he fell on his knees and went, oh, sovereign Lord. I don't think he did that. I think he just prayed momentarily in the quiet of his heart and then answered. Then wasn't a big deal, was it? But it was right at the moment, right there in the moment when he prayed. And he did that, and the peace of God, not the peace of people, the peace of God, which transcends, that means it's all over. All of our understanding is going to guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. He's saying, stop pulling the pieces. Stop thinking that if you see a thread, yeah, nobody here has ever done this, but every once in a while I'll see a thread, right? And what, what are you supposed to do with the thread? No, 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 you're wrong. You're pulling yeah, and you keep pulling it, right? You keep pulling it, and then a line goes up, you know, the arm or wherever it is. You just keep, God says, don't, stop pulling. God says, stop pulling on the threads of your life. Cut it off in prayer with thanksgiving. Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee. He's just had this marvelous time with all these people. They're in the boat. They're going across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is exhausted. You ever been exhausted? He's exhausted. So where is he? He's in the back of the boat, asleep. He's not updating his blog. He's not sending out texts. He's not sending out advance notices for where they're going. He's out of it. And the storm comes up. And the disciples who are, pro, who are the pros from Dover when it comes to the water... They, li- they earned their living on the water. They were fishermen. They knew this stuff. And it frightened them. And they, ca- they cry out to Jesus. And Jesus awakes and rebukes the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. In the middle of the storm, Jesus is not restricted to say, well, you got to wait. He can do that right, right away. He, has, he can do that. The storm, the disciples are in the storm of life, and they cry out to Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're instructed, we do this because we have been justified through faith. What, when are we justified? Have be, it says have been, so that means what? It's already, been done. it's already been done. When you receive Christ, when you give him the junk in your trunk and you take him, he takes some of your sin. All, all past, present. He takes it all. We have been justified through faith. And what else? We got the peace with God. Just like George was saying this morning, some people think God's what? A bully, right? A taskmaster, just looking for a chance to pull his belt off. 
when we were having dinner with my dad, uh, my family when I was young, and my dad went like this, my brother and I were like, what did we do? What did we do? Because the belt was the sword of Damocles, I guess. I don't know. But that's what we got hit with. God's not like that. Do you know why? Because he loves us. But there's another component to it. He already took his belt off. When Jesus was on the cross, how much of the payment for sin did Jesus receive? All of it. He paid for all of it. He bore in his body all of the wrath that was supposed to go where? On us. And who took it? Jesus took it. You see, we have been justified. We have peace with God. But how much do we walk around living this life wondering if I got peace with God? A lot. A lot. I do it. God, how can you let this happen? You're not paying attention. You must not love me. Wrong. He loves me. The fact that life is has problems isn't really God's problem where did the problems in this world come from us Adam and Eve started it all and we've been we've been riding that hobby horse all of our lives and yet what does God want to do he has paid for it he bore it on himself and he wants us to live a life in response to say, God loves me so much that he took it. Think about this scene about a woman at the well. Jesus comes and talks to her. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. I do know these things because you are the Christ. told me everything I've done. Does she look happy? She's overjoyed. Those are, uh, those were the disciples who were coming. She then goes into the town and starts telling everybody. He is the one. He told me, and guess what? They knew it. She was the topic of conversation in the town. She admits freely now what she had been trying to hide all those years. And as one person put it, you better believe all the men came out. Because here's this woman who says, he told me everything I ever did. Wondered if they knew about them. And this town comes out to Jesus because a woman told everything. John 17, 23 says, then the world will, this is Jesus speaking, then the world will know that you, Father, sent me 
and have loved them even as you have loved me. I want you to think about those words. Jesus says, the world will know that you have sent me and you, Father, have loved them. Okay, that's nice. God loves us. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. He says that you have loved them even as you, God the Father, have loved me. God's love for you is at the same level, same intensity, same intimacy as God the Father loving God the Son. And if that doesn't just cure something inside of us, no read, no when, no wonder she wanted to go and tell. No wonder the whole Greco-Roman world was turned on its ear. Because these are people who say, God loves me, God loves me as much as he loved his son. That is a revolutionizing thought. So when you go through this week, and it's coming, I don't know if it's going to be Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, you know, tomorrow I'm going to get gel injections in my knee, and if they miss, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to rant and rave, and, you know, I'm going to have some blood taken. If they miss the, if they miss the vein, what am I going to do? Well, I could. I can say, God has not abandoned me because he loves me right here, right now, the same way that God the Father loves God the Son. Now remember, God the Son, even though he experienced this love, was his life perfect? full of rose petals? No. He went through pain. He went through disappointment, broken relationships. There were times he was hungry, times he didn't have money. And there was even a time when he didn't get an answer to prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what does Jesus pray? Take this cup, this bitterness about... And, and take it away. But not if you want me to go through it. So even then, even as we go through these painful parts of life, God says, I'm never going to abandon you because I love you as much as I love my son. Take that thought this week and let it just worm its way into your life. so that we can be at peace with God, peace within ourselves, peace with one another, and even at peace with this cockamamie world. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I thank you that you are the only one who brings peace. Peace, I leave you. My peace, I give you, said Jesus. Boy, do we desperately want that. Thank you that your love for us is beyond understanding. Let us walk in your peace this week. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to offer you...